So good day, everyone. My name is Brian Prophet with the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central. Um, we're going to be talking about an exciting new project that Red Hat is working with in collaboration with the Linux Foundation and other organizations. But before I do introduce our guests to talk about that, the usual housekeeping notes. If you're not familiar with the BlueJeans interface, there is a question and answer section on the right side of your screen where you can pose questions for our presenters, um, which we will ask them in order of most upvoted at the end of their presentation. So we definitely encourage you to do that um, and get that dialogue going. Um, after we talk about the project today, which is SigStorm, and to bring uh, us information about SigStore and what it means and what Red Hat's involvement with that project is, I'm pleased to welcome two colleagues of mine from the office of the CTO, Luke Hines and Bob Calloway, who are both maintainers for SigStore. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you very much for coming on today. Good to be here, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Okay. Well, Luke, I believe you have a presentation to get us started. So if you want to get that set up, we'll be on our way. Great. Okay. Tell me if that's uh, rendering okay. We render, we see it fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Brian. So today we're going to go through SigStore. Uh, this is a, a relatively new project. It's uh, come under some public attention recently. As Brian mentioned, we've launched under the Linux Foundation. So I'm going to walk you through the reason that we uh, started the project, a bit about the technology and what our future plans are. So a quick speaker bio, Brian already did an introduction. So I work in the security engineering team of uh, Red Hat in the office of the CTO. I've been around open source for about 20 years now, showing my age there. And uh, other things I do, I work on the Kubernetes security response team. So I always like digging into vulnerabilities and have a general interest in open source security. And uh, recently I've joined the OpenSSF on the technical advisory. So um, open source supply chains. I'm not really going to go in depth around the different attacks. This is going to be a very sort of quick uh, recap of where we are. Anybody that's not convinced that there are problems has probably been living under a rock because you've all heard about the uh, solar winds attacks. And generally every, most every week there is some sort of attack that's been, that's getting sort of a quite wide media coverage, okay? So we know that this supply chain that we have is, it has many inherent weak parts, okay? So I list some of the attacks here. Replay freeze attacks that package managers can be uh, particularly prone to. Keys get compromised. Uh, SSO accounts can often be compromised. Um, people swap out. Some people will use a, a cryptographic digest that you can use to compare against uh, an artifact that you download off the internet. But a lot of the time, these digests are stored on insecure systems. Uh, build systems are compromised, and they're often compromised because the uh, the topology and the layout of these build systems are quite open. People can go in and read scripts and YAML scripts and they can see how systems work. So it allows them to, to recce the overall sort of architecture and topology of a build system. Typo swapping happens quite a lot. Maintainer accounts are taken over. I could add a big list here. There's, there's lots of um, weak aspects to, to open source supply chains. And I'm not going to let let off private secure supply chains. They, of course, have their problems as well, but we're focused on open source here. So we thought, what, what can we do about this? Is First of all, is there anything out there that we can adapt? So rather than reinventing the wheel, what is there in the open source ecosystem that we can utilize, technology that we can utilize to help improve this? And this is where we discovered something called certificate transparency. Okay, so this is an existing technology that's used quite a lot in PKI. It's, and it's built on a, a data structure called a Merkle tree. And we'll see what a Merkle tree is a bit later. So we noticed certificate transparency and, and we, 
we started to realize this could be applied to software supply chain transparency. So I will um, I will go into how we made that map shortly. But let me just give you a recap on what certificate transparency is. So before certificate transparency, this is how it would work. You would have your website admin, a browser, and a CA. Okay, so they're your main actors. And what would happen is the website admin would say, right, I'm redhat.com, please sign my certificate signing request to the CA, okay? And then the CA would say, yeah, okay, I'm gonna do some checks. This is all gonna happen behind a closed door, so you're just gonna have to trust me here. And they would do various things to, to make you prove that you are who you see, okay? They would say, yeah, okay, we're all good. Here's your signed certificate, Red Hat. And then the browser would say, okay, Mr. CA, I'm going to, I need to visit redhat.com. Are we okay here? Have you signed this? Is there a chain of trust to the root certificates that I have in my browser cert store or on my operating system? And then the CA would say, yeah, we're good. And then you would get the green padlock and you would believe everything is great, protected. You've got this wonderful TLS ecosystem and you have a, a nice green padlock. But realistically, everybody's trusting the CA. Okay, so we're trusting people within that organization and their, their uh, automation systems to actually really ensure that the person that's claiming to own a domain actually owns that domain. So there's a lot of trust put in a central party here. So this is where certificate transparency came about. Now, this is how it works now that it's, it's excuse me, I can't say that. This is now it, this is how it works now that certificate transparency exists. That's a little bit like she sells, she sells on the sea. Okay, so, so bear with me if my tongue gets tied up here. So again, we've got the same actors, the website admin, the CA, the browser, but now we have this new component called a certificate transparency log. Okay, so this is how it works now. Got exactly the same flow again. I'm redhat.com. Can you sign my CSR? Let me do some checks. Okay, you check out, you're good, here's your signed certificate. And then you have the browser who would say, hey, CA, redhat.com, are we good? Okay, now the difference is there's an extra step. And what happens is the CA submits an inclusion request to put their signed certificate into this thing called a transparency log. Okay, and then the browsers can now have this header where they say expect CT. So they expect the domain to be in the signature, uh, sorry, in the certificate transparency lock, okay? So they can then say, hey, redhat.com, uh, this, this particular certificate is on a website. Is there an inclusion? Can we prove the inclusion of that certificate in the transparency lock? If it's not in there, then most browsers will kick back with a warning screen. So that's, that's the key difference now. <clears throat> Now, what you can also do is you can then have people start to monitor the log, okay? and anybody can monitor these logs. We call them public transparency logs. So Red Hat can monitor entries coming into this log, saying, right, if we've got any new stuff, any new certificates that have been signed against redhat.com, or perhaps a subdomain of redhat.com, or, or a dynamic uh, subdomain of, of redhat.com. So they can, they can directly query the transparency log, if something turns up that they, that Red Hat didn't actually request to be signed, then we know, right, okay, this is not good. Somebody's trying to uh, spoof being redhat.com. So they've somehow got a signed certificate by this CA, because we have non-repudiation that a certain CA signed that, based on the uh, X509 certificates. Now, lots of people use certificate transparency logs in this way now. And this actually comes about from where a CA, I can't recall who it was, but they, they let, somebody came up and said, hey, can you sign google.com? They went, sure, here you go. So if you imagine if you've got like google.com or facebook.com, you can do a lot of damage. You know? Or imagine if you've got bankofamerica.com. So that's where this certificate transparency came from. Okay. Now this is run, uh, certificate transparency runs by, one is run by Let's Encrypt, okay, Cloudflare, and quite a few others run these. They're these public systems. 
And uh, not only do people monitor them for their domains being used, but they look for certain behaviors that are suspicious. So we thought, you know, what if we could take this technology and, and we could apply this to software transparency, concept of a transparency log. And this would allow us to then ask these sort of questions. So is somebody using my private key to sign an artifact, container or a binary? So you could monitor for your public key occurring within a transparency log. If your keys are hacked, then you can also look at the key that was hacked, the public key, how many times has that appeared in the transparency log? Then we know what digest was signed by those hacked keys. So we can establish the blast radius, okay? Uh, we can look at who signed a release. You can also check, is everybody else seeing the same as me? So this is a targeted attack. So this is where somebody says, the latest version of ACME software is 2.0.0. Okay. Now it turns out that there is a 2.0.1 that's been released and 2.0.0 contains a, a CVE of vulnerability. But somehow somebody targets you as a, an individual or a group to show you as this has been the latest version. So you think you're doing well, you've updated to the latest version. Turns out that there is a, um, <clears throat> there is a later release. You're under a targeted attack, so you don't know that. And then also, how can we have a good audit source that is, is tamper resistant? So we came, we, we started to look around the, the open source ecosystem and, and how they were signing things and how they were storing keys. And first of all, just a caveat, I cannot blame them, okay, because there is no real good technology out there for how to communicate your keys that are signed to, uh, used to sign a particular artifact. So you can see the one on the left is uh, Tails. Okay, so you go to Tails. Tails OS, for anybody that doesn't know, is by uh, journalists, people that need to uh, somehow sort of conceal their, their investigations that might be uh, picked up by a hostile state, for example. So all of their stuff is stored on a WordPress site, so anybody could get in and, and swap these keys out, swap the image out. To the right is Node.js, and you can see you have to trust all of those public keys, check past releases, okay? So it's, it's, it's not ideal, okay? But at the same time, I'm not gonna blame the victims here because this, they're doing the best with what they have. And the thing is that a lot of, uh, a lot of Software projects are not signing at all, so kudos for signing in the first place. Okay, so we came up with this idea of of having a, a software transparency log. Okay, and this is a project that we have called Recall. So it's a software supply chain transparency log. The everything is open source: the server, the client tooling, and then when an instance is running, it can be completely audited by third-party monitor. So we we started this project called Recall. And this is how software signing happens with Recor. I've just noticed some mistake. It says post uh, post six store. Okay, that you should consider that more post Recor because we're talking about the Recor project, which is part of six store. Okay, so what happens is a developer says, sign my package. Okay, they then they then actually put the package into the into the transparency log. So they put in these signing materials, and we'll see what the signing materials consist of. But I wanted to keep this infographic quite simple. So the sign-in events, in much the same way as a certificate, they go into the transparency log. Then the developer can start to monitor for, has somebody else signed my project? So for example, this tarball has a, a digest that they've signed against. Are other people using my keys? So the developer can start to ask those sorts of questions. At the same time, a user can say, hey, is it just me? Is there a targeted attack or is everybody else seeing the artifact that I have? Okay. And then your vendors and people of interest, they can start to see, is anybody signing with our keys or are they signing a piece of software that has perhaps Red Hat or, or Google or the Python Foundation, one of their sort of namespaces within that particular. Okay. So this is what we achieved with Sigstore. And just to, uh, sorry, with Recall, and just to kind of go a little bit more low level as to what's happening, you'll see there's this manifest. So these manifests are generated when somebody uses 
API to sign an artifact. So we've got a, a, a command line interface that makes it very simple to do this. You just pass in some flags around the artifact that you want to sign, your GPG key, public key that is, okay, and, um, and perhaps a URL if it's hosted already, if not a local reference artifact, okay. And we've made these manifests very extensible, okay, so you can support your own tooling type, so we support a PGP X509 mini sign, okay, and um, this is sort of our default type. This is stuff that, that Bob worked on that's, that's on the, the call. So if you have any questions about this, he can, he can field those questions in parallel. And these schemas are very customizable. So we tend to require that there is some sort of signing validate. Then we have non-repudiation about the artifact that is coming in. But essentially you have the what's being signed, the signature, okay, uh, the public key that was used, uh, the URL, the artifact, if it is hosted somewhere, and the hash, the digest of that artifact. And then somebody can then perform lookups against this using the digest or the public key and so on. So they can do inclusion proofs. Okay. Now, we spoke about Merkle trees and transparency logs. I, I realize I'm jumping about a bit here, but let's have a look at how these manifests and these transparency logs tie together. So Effectively, a, a Merkle tree, okay, is effectively parts are hashed, okay. So a, a, a digestive generated of what we call leaves. So if you look at these bottom four, consider those leaves, okay. And they're concatenated together, and then a hash is made of those hashes. And you keep going up until you divide down to the eventual root hash which is a complete computation of the entire tree, okay? Now, this makes it immutable and append only. So it's next to impossible to tamper with any individual hash, because then you completely change the ending root, okay? And with a Merkle tree, you're able to do inclusion proofs. So you can have a, a part or a leaf, Okay, and then you can compute that exists in the tree in its current form. Okay, now Merkle trees are actually used to sign black, uh, blockchain, blockchain transactions. Uh, BitTorrent has used them for quite a while. So the leaves are file parts. So, you know, the, the movie that you're downloaded is it, split into 100 pieces. Each one is hashed, and then they create a, a Merkle tree. And then as you receive those file parts from I think they're called seeds, you compute that they haven't been tampered with by looking at the eventual root hash, okay? And uh, this then ties into anybody that's interested in BitTorrent, I think you get like a magnet link, okay? And they're also Git uses a, a form of Merkle tree. So a commit hash is kind of like a root hash of the complete Git repository, okay? So we utilize this to store these manifests. Then, we know that nobody can tamper with those, and we can publicly order the uh, publicly audit, sorry, the the integrity of the the uh, transparency log. So here's kind of a, a quick overview of the the actors that we have involved. You can see there's the creators, they are developers, build systems, and they generate and sign these manifests. Uh, they populate those into recall. and then auditors, so package managers, security researchers, antivirus vendors query engines, they can monitor the log, and then clients, so users, they can then query, okay? And again, you'll see that we're format agnostic. So not only can you tailor the schema, you can also use XML, YAML, and JSON. And again, this is uh, Bob's work here, so he did some really good work to make us very agile around the format types that we work with. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to whiz on here in the interest of time. So we've got a pluggable PKI interface. We've got these pluggable, customizable schemas. Now, with Recall, we're currently live. We have a soft launch. So we've got a, a public instance that is available. There's a Swagger UI and so forth. Okay, so we then think, well, we're, are we, is this problem solved? Okay, have we solved this problem? We now have a transparency log. 
which is wonderful. People can sign things. They don't have to worry about where to store digests and public keys. And do they put them in a GitHub repo, readme or a website or, or all these sorts of things. So we've got this nice immutable store now, but nobody's signing anything. How are we going to get people to start signing stuff? OK, so this is where we then move into SIG store. So this is what we're working on at the moment and is what we're launching under the Linux Foundation. So we sold transparency, but very few projects. Software releases still. Uh, current signing tools don't scale, especially in a COVID world. It's not very easy to set up a web of trust and sign each other's keys in person. None of this works particularly well in automation. You know, do you want to have your private keys on in GitHub's infrastructure or, or GitLab or, or whoever? Probably not. Okay. And then as we said, not only do very few bother to sign, even less bother to actually verify. And we've had these tooling around for years and, and it's just not getting an adoption. Okay. So we realized we gotta try and make this stuff easy to use and, and lower the risks. So very quick roundup around who's signing what today. So a lot of them are storing their keys on a website. Obviously websites get hacked. Uh, Kubernetes are not signing anything at all. Uh, the Linux kernel is trust on first use. Okay. And uh, so it's, it's not great. And for package managers, so package managers, we're talking upstream managers here. We're not talking about RPM. They, they've got it nailed there, really, because they've got very strict controls around uh, GPG and key storage and, and signing and so forth. This is more this sort of the, the general ecosystem. So again, it's a very dotty picture. Crates don't do anything at all. Uh, you know, NPM, it's optional in PyPy and they use PGP. So it's really not a very good picture. OK, so we thought, what if we can make this easy? What if there were no private keys to store and worry about losing? We have a tamper proof store, which we already have with Recall. OK, it's simple to use. OK. And then we make this as available as a non-profit public goods service for anybody to use. So this is what we then got to work with, with SIGSTORE. Because as I said, signing should be simple. You shouldn't have to worry about where do I store my private key? You know, do I put things in a readme? What happens if I lose my laptop? Should I back up my keys on Dropbox? What happens if my key gets compromised? I've got 10 maintainers on my project. One of them's just disappeared. What do I do about their keys? It's, it's just, you know, nobody wants to deal with this headache. Don't get me wrong. You're probably, there's, I bet there's a crypto guru that's listening to this. That's, well, I can do all of this and, and that's really good. But a lot of people just don't. At the end of the day, it's just not getting the adoption. So again, I, I realize I've, I'm, I'm repeating my slide here. So, so what if we can make this easy? So no private keys to store. Keys are ephemeral, short-lived, okay? So there's no revocation. And what if we could use existing identity providers where they have lots of nice security controls built on top, such as two-factor authentication, one-time passwords. Okay? And then everything is public and transparent, okay? So we considered, first thing, let's get off PGP. Nothing personal against PGP, but it just doesn't work well in this context. And we consider, could we use X509? Okay, X509 is pretty much supported everywhere. PKI is very well established. And what if we could have certificates where they're provided for free? So we're talking about the Let's Encrypt public good model here. Okay, and then we can issue certificates based on a, an Open ID Connect identity. Okay, so CAs can a CA will publish. The CA, as in a SIG store CA, will publish a certificate, into the which will go into the transparency log, and then uh, individuals can monitor that log, for instances of their, their email address or their name or their previous public keys coming up. So this is the current architecture, and I realize that's a bit of a headache to take in, and time permitting, I'm not going to get through all of that. So luckily, I've made a kind of a simpler one, but anybody that prefers really digging into the details, I recommend you contact us guys by the, the, this particular Community Central event. But to kind of do a, a more of a high level overview, how this works. So 
a user generates locally, we never have private keys on six store infrastructure. They generate short lived private keys. Okay. What happens then is they make a, they put a request into the web PKI. So they, they encrypt their email address, they make a challenge. Okay. And then they're presented with an OIDC connect grant request. Okay. They perform that grant request. Okay. And then the web PKI compares the email that was in the challenge to the email that comes back from the open identity provider, the grant scope. So we actually make sure the person that is making this request owns this account. Okay. Now, if that computes correctly, what happens is a certificate is returned, an X509 certificate that contains the email. Okay. And at the same time, this certificate goes into a transparency log. Okay. Then the user then signs the digest. I say then, this happens very quickly. Okay, there, there's not really, um, a lot of this will be asynchronous. Uh, the keys are then sent to the signature, trans sorry, the, the signature and the public key and the digest is sent to the signature transparency log. Okay, and then the, the sort of the, the keys can then be discarded. So these don't even need to touch the disk. There's no concerns about managing the private keys here. They're short lived, okay? And we timestamp everything as well when they go into the certificate transparency log and the signature transparency log. And what happens then is we have a trust route, okay? So we can be sure that Luke Hines at redhat.com using an identity service provider signed an artifact with a particular digest and it is at an exact time. And you can do this by looking at the certificate in the transparency log, okay, which contains the email and the public key of the keys that we used to also sign the digest, which is stored in the signature transparency log. And that way we've got rid of the keys, yet we can still perform a trust validation based on the cryptographic properties of the signed certificate and the keys that we use to sign the digest into the signature transparency log. So we're working on this at the moment. We're making good progress. We're working on the web PKI. We already have the signature transparency log. Uh, the certificate transparency log is, is relatively easy to put up. We can use existing code that's there. Okay. And we hope quite soon to be in some sort of perhaps beta test phase where people can start trying this out. So um, wrapping up now, look at that, that's right on the 30 minutes. So our plan is to launch this as a non-profit free service. Okay, and this will be on the Linux Foundation. We're very much basing this on Let's Encrypt. Uh, we're not interested in harvesting people's data. When the OpenID Connect session happens, the only thing that we get is the email address. And that is just so that we have this trust route. Okay, now if somebody is extra paranoid and they still want to use their own keys, then they can sidestep the open ID thing. They can use their own key pair and they can still put that into the signature transparency. So we're not sort of making anything, this is not sort of some sort of mandatory overlord, make everybody use open ID connect to sign things or we won't trust it. There's nothing happening there. Our, our, in, our intentions here are to make something that's useful and to finally get signing happening in the community, which, as you've seen, is is a very uh, spotted picture at the moment. So anybody that wants to find out more details, I recommend you come to our website, sigstore.dev. Uh, you'll then find, be able to find our repositories. <clears throat> you'll be able to find a bit more about the solution, and you'll be able to find out how to connect with the developers. And uh, so, yeah, I encourage anybody to come along and ask questions. And last of all, the uh, just to reiterate, source code is 100% open. The tooling is open source code. And the operations, so we have like a Kubernetes operator, and uh, there will be various sort of, you know, we need to think about backing up the transparency logs and so forth, which we intend to keep not the private materials around, you know, passwords and stuff that we need for our own infrastructure, but generally how we run that 
will be open. So effectively, anybody could stand up their own six for them. Okay, if we all disappear, then this can can be continued to run. Uh, so we kind of under a soft launch already, but we're on, we're also actively developing on our second phase. Again, just to make it clear, this will be free to use non-profit. It's a public good service and it's run under the LF. And the current members are Red Hat, uh, Google, and Purdue University. So there's a, a professor who's part of it, the Intoto project, which is also around secure supply chain. He's working on this with us. And since we've gone live, a lot of other people have turned up and showed an interest. So that brings me to the end of um, the presentation. Okay, so um, let me just stop shining, uh, stop shining, stop sharing, sorry, uh, come back. So uh, I guess, do we do a Q&A now? Do we? we? We do do a Q&A, and our first question is from Ian, and I believe you has answered this towards the end of your presentation, but we'll go ahead and reiterate the question. Ian asks, is there an on-premise version of this for organizations to be able to sign their own content um, and then only trust the content they sign after going through their validation process? There, so, yes, anybody can stand this up internally. Very much, yeah. So, so the the ability to do that is all of the code is open to stand up a server to deploy your own CLI tooling. So this could easily be uh, harnessed internally behind a firewall. I don't know, Bob. Did you have any further? No, we we intend to publish um, the kind of example, you know, kube configs and whatnot to make it easy for folks just to get it up and running. Um, but as, as Luke mentioned, we're we're also trying to address the you know, the general open source project use case where we have a public good service that lots of folks can take advantage of. But we recognize there's certain use cases that, you know, like Luke mentioned, if I if I feel comfortable with my key management practices, um, then I may want to just leverage certain components of the architecture uh, for, to address certain issues, and that's totally fine too. And we'd love to hear more about those uh, those use cases as well to make sure that we're, we're addressing the comprehensive set of, of the problems in the space. Okay, good. All right, so next question is from Saul, who asks, what is the deployment model for certificate transparency logs distributed across all clients, a few trusted logs? So how does that work? So yeah, if I understood this right, there is um, generally there is a single transparency log. You can have multiple, okay, but they're not out of the box. It's not like a blockchain, you've got distributed nodes. But you can connect them together using something called a gossip protocol. But it's but it's also quite possible for people to have uh, run separate transparency logs and then just inform users which transparency. You almost think of it like a PGP piece. And one of the other things, just to layer on there, is all of the data in the transparency log is 100% publicly accessible, at least for the public good service. We actually have a concept of what's called a monitor um, that's actually going all along and reviewing the integrity of the Merkle ha uh, tree hashes uh, as we go forward. So in, a set, in essence, instead of having replicate, uh, replicates of the single instance of the transparency log around for everyone to have to go through and, and validate, we simply provide the infrastructure and the raw content such that if anyone wants to go back and improve the integrity, they can certainly do so. so like uh, Luke mentioned, the professor at Purdue uh, is off working on actually setting up that infrastructure today for, for the public good instance that we're launching. Okay, good to know. Next question is from Timote. Um, have you considered not supporting open PGP given the problems with the specification, the implementation, the US and so forth? Yes, yeah, so with the uh, signature transparency log on its own, we do have PGP support there. And that's really sort of seen now more for the scenario of behind the firewall or a private instance. Okay. Somebody there can have very tight controls around their PGP. Okay. Now, at the same time, we don't see it being utilized in the open source ecosystem because of 
the points that Sal just made there. You know, GPG, it has its issues. People might argue otherwise, but I'd be in complete agreement there. So that's where we really will, for, for the whole kind of um, OIDC dance, Web PKI, that will only be with X509. But we still keep GPG support there. For instance, you might have somebody that they have a HSM. It's a locked room. You know, there's very strict controls around who can sign what. And, and so for them, they can still use the signature transparency lock. And we also have mini sign in there as well. All that I believe, is it um, OpenBSD use that? Do you have any, Bob, chip in if you have any further? Yeah, I wouldn't say we're encouraging the proliferation of PGP, but we certainly need to meet people where they're at, and there are a number of projects that are signing um, today mm -hmm. with that. So what we'd like to see is them to get into the practice of using a transparency log, encouraging their the consumers of those projects to actually verify the content of the log, and then over time, if we can actually switch them over to a more efficient mechanism that we think we've we've created here, then that's that's certainly goodness as well. Okay. Um, next question is from Chris, who asks, what happens when the key specified by URL becomes unavailable? Uh, let's say the web server disappear. Does SigStore automatically dereference the URL and store the full pub key? Yes, yeah, so great question. Short answer is yes. Um, you can pass in the references into the manifest, but we actually go download the content, verify the signature, store the actual content of the key and the signature in the log. So we don't have any issues of web servers disappearing or content delivery networks redirecting to different content, anything like that. Um, if, if you try to validate and the signature is unavailable, then, then we're not going to put an entry into the log for that because we, we require that signature be verified before we do anything else. Okay. Um, Another question from Lewis. This one is asking, does SigStore have a notion of ordering of artifacts? For example, you may want to understand the timeline of events between artifact creations. So, we don't inherently have that in SigStore, in, in recall, but time stamping is going to be a key part of this. So generally what we do is we provide, transparently provide the information okay, around who signed what at what particular time and what the digest was. Okay. And then others can then utilize the service to make sort of attestation type decisions where you would then look at, you know, like a, an ordered, an ordered sort of, I uh, can't remember the, there's a really good way Lewis used to describe it, but I, I know what he's articulating there. So, so generally, we we agree this is a very good thing to do, but we've got quite a bit on our hands just to get this infrastructure in place. So we're expecting others to then uh, utilize the APIs that we have in the signature transparency log to start making these sorts of business logic decisions around behaviors. So just, I think I mentioned it in the presentation, uh, Recore, which is the signature transparency log, that has an open API. So we have like a, there's a swagger UI that you can go along and see exactly how the, the APIs work. So somebody could integrate with a signature transparency log and you don't have to know how to compute inclusion proofs. Do all of the crypto operations, it's very simple. Uh, HTTP requests. Okay. I'm going to skip the questions a little bit because you you mentioned infrastructure and having your hands full with that. And, and there's a question that kind of leads into that um, from Chris again, who who says, seems like it would be expensive to scan this entire log. If I want to monitor this record for uses of my key, I need to download every manifest to check it. Does this scale in a reasonable way with the number of transactions or do I need to provision a massive infrastructure for this. Hmm. Bob, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So you're right in terms of it's, you can think of it as, do I want to go back and verify the entire integrity of the entire blockchain? Yeah, I mean, you can. Uh, it would certainly take quite a long time. And so the analogy here with the, certificate, with the uh, transparency law, uh, I think is a valid one. 
one thing that we are doing to try to help mitigate some of these impacts are we're deploying what we're calling indices that we're um, putting alongside the log such that if I want to simply query, show me all the entries associated with this public key or show me all the ent entries associated with this digest value, um, we have a, the way to quickly query that so that you don't have to iterate through um, the log in a, in, you know, in a sequential fashion. So, you know, as we add more and more capabilities with the web PKI and hooking this all together, again, that's that's certainly where we're, we're really interested in getting feedback from folks around what are you trying to do with a log and how can we make it more efficient so that we prevent having to go download everything. But the intent, again, going back to my comment earlier around monitors, is that perhaps, you know, we'll have a published record to say, hey, X entity has verified the integrity of a log up until this particular date. And when I want to go back and scan through anything further, you can actually record the state where you have already looked in the past and, and only do the incremental work uh, as you go forward. So long story short, yeah, we're, we're aware of, of some of those challenges and trying to address them relatively quickly. Okay, hey, good to know, thank you. So another que uh, a question from Ricar uh, Ricardo who asks, is it right to say that the only one that can really say if something is wrong or not in the log is the developer themselves? For example, Red Hat key ends up being used to sign malicious artifact, artifacts. Is the user able to detect this? So <clears throat> what we do is we, we tie the signing to an identity. That's the trust route, okay? So what you would have to do then is, is you would then decide what constitutes trust as the consumer, okay? So you might trust that lhines at redhat.com signed this, okay? And that's sufficient, or you may require that more people sign off a particular artifact, okay? And you might require that it, so you know that L Hines is a maintainer on this project. I maintain Python requests or, or whatever the project is. Then you can also have criteria around it should happen between a, a certain time period it correlates to when a release came out. So again, it's the thing of um, we, we're providing the, the source of truth and then we will look to address this as well. We're going to put up example systems that will show people how to, to quickly perform these attestations of trust and so forth. But it's not something that we've actively working on at the moment. Bob, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, ultimately it comes down to the, the notion of trust and, you know, I as a consumer of a piece of software, how do I know which versions are valid and which ones are not? If I simply am relying on, you know, lists as, uh, lists of, of SHA hashes on a, on a static website, well, we know that there are instances where those websites can get hacked. And so we almost need a <laughs> an approach to drive transparency plus policy such that open source projects can actually publish that in a in a mutable way. Maybe a transparency log would make sense here, maybe it wouldn't. But ultimately to connect into policy engines, so you could envision a case where when I go to deploy a pod on, on a kube cluster, I actually go and do a policy validation to ensure that A, the stuff's in the log, B, that it meets the, the policies dictated by the project, and then any other overarching policies that might exist within the enterprise before I ever go and download that code and, and deploy it into a cluster. So as Luke said, yeah, it's a it's a problem that we're looking at, and it's also tied back to you know how do we start to encourage behavior of validation in general? Um, and so when I go and I download it, you know, dependencies inside of code, you know, a lot of people do that blindly today, have no idea what CVEs are in there, much less what signed content they're pulling. Um, so there's there's a lot of problems in that space that need to get addressed more comprehensively. We're we're only at the tip of the iceberg. From, making a ton of progress on that, but we're super excited. We think this stuff that we're talking about here today is is the right foundation to build upon to make a, to address a lot of those issues. Yeah, so you can almost think of, it's probably a poor analogy, or, but it's almost like um, you have blockchain, you know, like Ethereum, which is the foundation, and then people build the apps on top to use, to, to make use of the immutable data that's there you know, the, the, the guarantees that you have there. So, so we're just trying to get that solid foundation and then hope to work with others to build apps that will sit on top of that. Like a very quickly, an example app is a lot of you will know, have I been pwned? 
Okay, so you go on to haveibeenpwned.com, you put in your email address, and it tells you all the times that that email address has occurred within a hack. Okay, so you could put in your email address, and you could then uh, rest, register to a second email address so that every time that primary email address comes into the log, somebody signs something. That you know that somebody's compromised your account and they're assigning things. So again, it, it can it can really sort of have many different spin-off use cases that could be built on top of this. Okay. And with that, we are out of time for questions and we are at the end of our uh, session today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for walking us through uh, SigStore and what it means for um, security moving forward. We really appreciate your insights. Well, thank you for having us, Brian. It's been a great yeah, host, like thank you. Okay, great. And with that, we'll wrap up another edition of Community Central. Stay tuned. Next week, we will be featuring um, the creators of Red Hat Arcade. Until then, we uh, certainly wish you well, be safe, and have a great day.